So one of the areas that Morgan just spoke about and that I really think about as we build this conference every year is that we need to continue to do better at getting the voices around the table that aren't here this year, that weren't here last year, that every year we try to make that table include a few more voices. And hopefully you've seen we've done that over the years by being really strict. We have a mandatory gender diversity requirement on our sessions, racial and ethnic diversity requirement on our sessions. And that's sort of a token, let's make sure those are sort of visually represented. But it's the first step in saying, look, if you're working in a sector where it's really hard for you to find a female panelist, that's a larger problem for that sector. So as we've been having those conversations over the years, we've had many amazing partners in the inclusive entrepreneurship track last year and um, partners around gender lens investing. So when the Kellogg Foundation came to us this year and said, we'd really like to work with you closely to do a deep track fully focused on equity and diversity, we were thrilled. And they've been so generous in opening up access to their very thoughtful, uh, brilliant staff. And we had amazing conversations. If you haven't been to some of the racial equity sessions yet, I'd really encourage you to participate in one at some point during SOCAP. Um, and I'm really excited for you to hear sort of the bigger picture behind Kellogg's work why this conversation matters. And you're gonna hear from AJ Jones, who's their senior policy advisor, and works directly with the CEO of the Kellogg Foundation across their grant making and policy and public-private partnerships. And I think you'll really enjoy hearing from AJ. Please welcome him to the stage. Well, good morning, and thank you all so much for allowing me to be here today. You have to understand that when you are representing the Kellogg Foundation, we come from the place that created the breakfast. And so for all intents and purposes, we rise early because we know that the day doesn't start until the breakfast is going. Now, I must admit to you today that this has been a wonderful set of experiences and dialogues, but nothing can be greater than the idea that we are here to think about how do we bring the combination of capital, ideas, and good under one roof. Now, that happens not because of hopeful or wishful thinking. It happens because of purpose, determination, and thought leadership. But after all, none of these things come together without a sense of dedicated understanding, a committed set of folks, and more importantly, a wheelhouse to say, how can we do better? As we begin this conversation, I would be remiss to be able to start the conversation by thanking people. For those of you who may or may not know, I am from the South, and in the South, you don't start your day without thanking those who led, led before you. So for all intents and purposes, I would like to thank Lindsay, Robert, I'd also like to thank my good friends who got me wired up and got me looking good, Joe and Russell. I would also like to make sure I give a shout out to Jamie. But most specifically, I want to make sure I give a, a concerted shout out to a woman by the name of Miss Hansen. Can we give her a round of applause, please? I am also genuinely grateful for the entire SOCAP board, for all those who are involved in making this Re, this possibility of reality, and more importantly, for those who are co-investors with us, for those who are partners with us, for those who are champions and grantees with us, that we are here today to show a concerted and united front that this too, we shall change. And for all intents and purposes, that is what the philosophy of the Kellogg Foundation sits upon and rests upon. Now, for those of you who may or may not know, the foundation didn't start with me, nor did it start with anyone in this room, but for many of us, we are responsible for carrying on the legacy, if you will, of the foundation. With that being said, I have to give a shout out to two of the most phenomenal ladies in the foundation, Dana Lenane and Cynthia Mueller. Give them a round of applause too as well. It is with their concerted effort, their passion, their insight, their thought leadership that we have been able to be before you today but more importantly, that we have been able to talk about racial equity and not be in a position of posture of defense. That we can actually open the conversation and say, how do we do better? 
As I began this conversation, I am reminded that when I, I got the invite, I was so giddy. I was like a kid in the candy store thinking about, well, what should I start with first? What should be the topic that I should engage upon? How should we consider the way in which we can think about the change that we can make, but more importantly, the motivation that we can push in this conversation? And then I thought about, well, what would be the potentiality of a, of a nice or well-positioned quote to begin the conversation. And I began to think about it and research and look at it, consider and wind around. And I began to reflect, if you will, on our founder who started this foundation out of a conversation that he had with President Herbert Hoover, who said, could we do better for all children? And what can be dedicated to that conversation? And it was from there that we began this 87-year history of trying to think about how can we do better in terms of children so that they can all thrive, that we can ensure that our investments are in the people whom which will propel this country, this nation, but more importantly, this world, to be a little bit better than how they found it. But I'm also reminded that in that context, in the glow of that particular ideal, there is the soft and often deeper and more harder underbelly. An underbelly that was exposed by a writer by the name of W.E.B. Du Bois, or Dubois. I know somebody that got some money in here, so I know it's a little different. <laughs> W.E.B. Du Bois once raised up in his book called Souls of Black Folk, first page, first line, first chapter, between me and the other world, there is always an unasked question. How does it feel to be a problem? And he goes on to say that being a problem is a very strange experience, especially when one does not know what it's like not being a problem. Treating people as a problem people versus people with some problems. And I would argue that the goal for the day, the motivation for the day, the reason why we are here at SOCAP is to be able to begin the effort and to mobilize our resources around addressing that very issue that these are not problem people, these are simply people who have problems for us to solve. And it is up for our concerted efforts to be able to do such. I am also reminded too as well that in the context of this, this is about a competitive advantage. We are not doing the issues around diversity or inclusion because it feels good. We are not addressing issues around how do we have a more equitable society because it will allow for us to move a little higher up on our UN rankings. We are not, if you will, engaging on this conversation because we think that it will allow for us to have wonderful cocktail parties over goat cheese. No, this is about how do we think about our competitive advantage? How do we do good, make money, and also make a change all at the exact same time? For after all, the invention of America was based upon that very premise. And it is there that we began the conversation, that we began to look for partners, but more importantly, that we began even internally in our own organization having this conversation. But I'm often reminded too as well that with every conversation, it always starts in spits and spurts, that there is never a linear direction that one takes, if you will, when addressing issues of diversity, inclusion, but more importantly, the issue of racial equity. Because in a conversation, you begin to peel back layer upon layer, and you begin to find yourself thinking about how do we reach and address the truth, if you will, around it. And oftentimes, I'm reminded that sometimes truth is the conversation we can all agree upon. And now that we have entered into this new epoch where there are differentiated conversations about what is and what isn't real when it comes to news, or what is what isn't real when it comes to history, what is what isn't real when it comes to narrative, we are understanding that in order for us to be able to make a change, we have to level set. And in a level setting, I am reminded that us at the Kellogg Foundation have our own history to confront. For 30 some odd years ago, as the Kellogg Foundation began this work on racial equity, we ourselves had an imbalance and an improper structure around racial equity. In fact, our current CEO, Lejeune Montgomery Tabron, was the first African-American in 1987 to be hired as a professional staff member. 
or more importantly, the fact that in our board structure, we had no person of color in our board structure up until almost 30 years ago. And how that fed to our staff was because that we were serving, if you will, communities which we did not look like as an organization, thus inhibiting our ability to have a truly authentic connection, but more importantly, a deep sense of girded responsibility for how do we usher the next generation. And it's from there that we began this process of how do we go about changing the way in which we as a foundation, as a philanthropic, but more importantly as a social agent, began this conversation internally. Now you all can imagine some of the most difficult conversations you can have are those that are inside your own house. For oftentimes you find a revelation that you thought you all agreed until you all didn't. And it is from there that we began the conversation of saying, well, this issue around racial equity isn't something that should be programmatic or with one set of team, teams or with one set of people who are concerted. This has to be across the entire organization. That in fact, from the board to the executive staff, to the leadership, to even the people who sit at the front desk must understand that this issue on racial equity is their issue is their ownership, is their responsibility. And it is from there that we began the hard work of saying, how do we reflect and look at ourselves? But more importantly, we began the hard work of thinking about how does our asset and investment side of the house align with our programmatic and ideal part of the house? Now, this is a, a bit of a unique dynamic, if you will, because what that means is that you are now going into spaces that traditionally have never had to think about diversity or inclusion because they only thought about, quote unquote, the bottom line. As if to disaggregate the idea that the bottom line is somehow hindered because you would bring people from more diverse backgrounds, more diverse perspectives, more diverse insights, if you will. And so we began this process of introducing something called our emerging managers conversation looking at how do we focus on money managers and be able to look at the diverse cadre of people who from, come from diverse backgrounds who we can then cultivate, bring, and structure a pipeline around. So that therefore, when we're looking at who do we give our assets to manage, we are not only building our asset base and also expanding our ability for better returns, but we are also bringing a social good by creating more individuals from diverse backgrounds to be able to engage in our work by allowing for both sides of the houses to see the responsibility of racial equity being one of their own, we are not knuckle dragging anybody into a conversation. We are yet leapfrogging, if you will, into what the conversation should be. Now, I must admit to you that these things are not things that are of ease and are of approach. That these things are issues that we have to confront as a country, but more importantly as a nation as we think about the way in which we engage. I'm also excited if you were to talk about our Entrepreneur Diversity of Color Fund, I'm the Entrepreneur color, color Fund that we did in Detroit. Something that we learned very early on is that if we partnered with people like J.P. Morgan and others, and we thought about how can we have an impact fund that did not look at the issue around credit scores and those kind of things, when they thought about who could be a great entrepreneur and looked at who had discipline, ideas, focus, and energy that we could actually change the landscape in terms of business offerings and services throughout the greater Detroit area. And that I stand before you today and call a success. And it has continued to now be a model where we have really changed the way in which people think about how do we engage and deploy capital. As we continue our conversation, I'm also reminded that we have, if you will, a number of areas that we have to think about looking at impact investing. And none can be more important than the film and entertainment industry. After all, the need to be able to change narrative is part and parcel to the ability for us to be able to design policy, ideas, concepts, and realities that can actually be able to move the kind of society forward. For after all, whom we may call a freedom fighter, others may call an insurgent, or a terrorist, or a, re or a, 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 or a member of a fascist or a left-wing group or a right-wing group or what have you. How we define people ultimately leads to the categorization of how we bring about solutions. 
And nowhere has this been more important than the issue around diversity. And so what we realize is that to change the issue around racial equity. So we realize that the, issue, the way to be able to change that is to think about how do we leverage the ideas around film, music, and TV to shape those realities. And it was from there that we began a partnership to look at the distribution problems around content that was more forward-leaning, if you will, in terms of addressing the needs of society. We began this conversation with a guy by the name of Mr. Norman Lear. Some of you might know him. He was a famous gentleman and continues to be and brought to you everything from Archie Bunker to Good Times to the Jeffersons. But we asked the question of him is, what is the problem? And what he became to tell, let us to know is that content is needed, but distribution is your issue. And it was from there that we looked for who could be distribution partners to work with. And we came across a wonderful gentleman by the name of Charles King, a former super agent, if you will, in Hollywood who decided to open up something called Macro Ventures to look at how do we produce and curate, but more importantly, distribute various types of media that can be much more embra embracing and impactful and create empathy among those who are suffering or those who labor under a racial tension that inhibits their ability to thrive. And lastly, some of you may have attended our session that we had on our business case on racial equity. For after all, competitive advantage is all about making the case. As I stand before you today, even in our own foundation, we have one of the most, de one of the most diverse investment teams. And they are currently, as our CIO would say, Joe Wittenberg, knocking it out the park. And the reason why is because from their diverse backgrounds, from their insights and from their, their relationships, they have been able to source and be able to build ideals around it. That, my friend, is key in terms of making the case. And as I end this conversation, what I will share with you is this. Let us not forget that the beginning of a movement does not start, if you will, with the collective action of all. It begins with the conversion of one. Thank you so much.